I'm very pleased to be introducing a crowd favorite for WordCamp, Kent, Nathan Ingram. He has been a freelance web developer in Birmingham, Alabama since 1995. Currently, he is the host at iThemes Training, where he teaches WordPress and freelance business development topics via live webinar. Please welcome Nathan. Hey, thanks, Megan. It's great to be here with everybody. Thanks so much for taking time on a Saturday to learn more about WordPress and business and just to make general improvements about everything going on in your world. WordCamp such a great opportunity to do that. It's kind of a bummer we couldn't be here in person, but this is the next best thing. So thanks, everybody, for being here today. Uh, as Megan mentioned, my name is Nathan Ingram from Birmingham, Alabama. I'm a growth coach for WordPress business owners. In, uh, in addition to being that host at iThemes Training, uh, creator of Monster Contracts, and I've been doing this web thing since 1995, so quite a while. Uh, if you would like the slide download, you can do that at nathaningram.com slash WordCampKent. Uh, you'll have everything that you see on the screen, as well as a one-page summary of what we're going to talk about today called the Scope Strategy. So you can get all that at nathaningram.com slash WordCampKent. So let's talk about why we're here today. Uh, over the next uh, 40, 35, 40 minutes or so, we're going to talk about why you desperately need a strategy for client consultations. And by client consultations, I mean whatever you call that first in-person or video meeting with the client where you're getting to know each other a little bit and, and talking about this project that you may or may not embark upon together. So you need a strategy for that, and we're going to talk about why as we get started. Then we're going to look at the purpose of the client consultation and why we're doing this to begin with because in my experience, both in, in my own business working with clients and in almost seven years now of coaching uh, WordPress business owners from around the world, I find that a lot of times we forget what the real purpose ought to be, and it's not just to sell a website. But then we'll spend the most of our time talking about what I call the scope strategy, which is a memorable five-step process to make sure you stay on track during this first meeting with a client. And so that's where we'll spend most of our time today. But let's get started with why this is important. Why in the world do you need a strategy for a client consultation? So I want to tell you a few stories. And uh, we're going to start once upon a time. This may or may not ever have happened. It, hint, it actually did. This, these are you know, my own experience for ways that I've really messed this up. So once upon a time, I'm sitting in a coffee shop. And I'm meeting with a client that I think, okay, this client has real potential. Uh, everything looks great, you know, from the, our initial first conversations over email, and I'm excited. So we're sitting there, and we're, I'm trying to start talking about the project that he wants to create. And I'm sitting there, and he's going on and on and on about how his dog escaped out of his fence this morning. And he just, he, that's all he's focused on. And before I know it, and I'm trying to be nice, and yeah, hey, this is, you know, I'm sorry that, you know, and whatever. And the story just goes on and on. And before I know it, it's been 45 minutes that I've spent listening to his dog getting out of the fence. And when we finally get around to talking about the website that he wants to build, I realize he has no idea what he wants. So have you ever spent hours talking to a client and gotten absolutely nowhere? If you have, that's one of the reasons that you need a strategy for this client consultation. How about this? Once upon a time, I'm sitting in my car. And yes, by the way, that is my license plate. Yes, I am that big of a WordPress nerd. My, my license plate is WP Admin. Uh, so anyway, I'm sitting in my car uh, after meeting with a client, and I, I'm, I'm feeling great, right? The things went really well, and I think I've knocked it out of the park with this client. I'm congratulating myself. I'm patting myself on the back. And then you ever have that feeling it's like a bucket of cold water gets poured on your head because you have this startling realization? That's what happened to me, and I realized that I'd forgotten to talk about something. And it was something very, very important about this project, and really any project, and that is the topic of website management. And uh, this is something I teach a lot. If you ever heard me speak on recurring revenue, then you've maybe picked up this thought that the key to building a successful business in WordPress is recurring revenue, really any business, but especially in WordPress is building some sort of recurring revenue. And if you're gonna sell a WordPress care plan, website management services, you've got to start talking about that from the first conversation. And I realized I'd forgotten to talk about that with this particular client. So I'm sitting there in my car and I was feeling great and then I'm feeling lousy. So have you ever left a consultation with a client and forgotten to cover something important. If you have, 
then that's why you need a strategy. Or how about one more story? Once upon a time, I'm sitting there at my desk and I'm checking my email because I'm waiting on pins and needles for a client's reply to a proposal that I worked really hard on. Like I had poured over this proposal. I'd worked really, you know, I'd gotten everything together into what I thought was the perfect scope of work. I had consulted the thesaurus for all of the right adjectives and all the right words to put everything in these nice, neat little bullet points. Everything looked great. And then I spent, like a lot of us do, I, had, I spent time just absolutely worrying about the price, right? So I, I should charge about $5,000. And I'm thinking about $5,000. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but then imposter syndrome kicks in. So uh, maybe $3,800. Yeah, $3,800. No, let's go $4,500. Uh, no, no, no. Forty-seven seventy-five. That's what I'm going to do. And so I spent, you know, thirty minutes wrangling over the perfect price point, and sent the proposal to the client. And then, ding, the email comes in, and the reply from the client is, "Wait, forty-seven seventy-five? I thought this would be around eight hundred dollars." So, have you ever agonized over a proposal only to discover that you were way off the client's budget? If you have. If any of those stories are relatable, that's why you need a strategy for a client consultation. You've got to take control of the meeting because you're spending your time with the client. And I bolded that word because that's truly what you're doing. Time is money. And you know, by the way, I'm not a fan of hourly pricing, but most of us have in the back of our mind somewhere some idea of what our hourly rate is if we were ever going to charge an hourly rate. And we kind of use that sometimes maybe to calculate uh, other prices for projects and so forth. So if you, you think about your hourly rate and just for round numbers, let's say your hourly rate is $100 an hour. And you think about how much time have I invested in this client? How much time have I spent on this client? And if it's two and a half hours, then you've essentially just spent $250 trying to cultivate this sale. And if I'm going to invest if I'm going to spend literally my time on this client, I need to make it count. So we've got to figure out how to take control of this client meeting. That brings us to the next very important piece of this, which is why are we meeting with this client to begin with? What is the purpose of this meeting? And it's not just to sell a website. This is so important because a lot of times we go into a meeting with a client thinking, I've got to sell the website. Like I got to make some money. I got to get some cash in the door. Uh, and I'm just going to do whatever I can to make this client agree to do business with me. But the client consultation should not just be about selling a website. It's really better, I've learned, to sort of uh, picture this meeting like it's a first date. You got to be sure this relationship is going to work. Because if you start uh, with a client that is not a great fit or they're a bad client for one reason or another, then you've probably just latched yourself onto a person for the next several weeks or months, and it's just going to be miserable. So really, you got to treat this almost like a first date. We got to be sure this relationship is going to work from our perspective and, by the way, from the client's perspective. So we're not there just to sell a website. We're also not there to refine the client's business plan. I can't tell you how many hours I've wasted with a client Trying and, and I end up providing business advice to the client, uh, refining their business plan, thinking, you know, this is really not going to work. What if you did it this way? Because, you know, I try to be a nice person and I, I, I've given away so much time in business consulting because the client had no idea what he or she really wanted to do. Now, you may be able to help with business consulting. I mean, that's, that's something I do, and that might be in your toolbox of services. But it's not, that does not equal building a website. Those are two separate things. So when we meet with a client to talk about the website, we got to keep on focus. All right, are, do, they, do they have a plan? Do they have branding? Do they have, you know, all, there's a lot of different things that are involved with building a website besides building a website. So we have to keep in mind what we're actually there to do. Uh, something else that we're not there to do is to answer a million questions for the client. Uh, now, I wrote a, a book uh, last year called Dealing with Problem Clients, Building Fences Around Friendly Monsters. And I think I presented that talk last year actually live at WordCamp Kent. It's one of my favorite talks to present. And one of the problem clients that I talk about in that book is the one that I call the question mark. And the question mark loves to ask questions. Um, and if you ever get into a consultation with a client and they just question after question after question after question after question. Now, some questions are legitimate, right? But if they monopolize 
the hour or two or three that you end up spending with them in this consultation and you can't really get a question in ed edgewise, that's a problem. Uh, and a lot of times we end up giving away what I would call proprietary intelligence for nothing because the client hasn't made any commitment financially back to us. They're just there picking our brains about the website. And so a rule of thumb that I always use in a client consultation, I'm not there to answer a million questions. Now, what questions are free? What is the website going to do? What do we need to accomplish? What is the purpose? But the how questions, those are not free. And if they want to get into how we're going to accomplish this, well, you know what? That is proprietary information. It's something that I've taken 25 plus years assembling the, the processes and the tools to pull this off. And, you know, it, that's how I make a living. If you want that information, we've got to, you know, establish some sort of a, an official relationship, which means money is involved, right? So keep in mind not only what the consultation is for, but what the consultation is not for. Which leads me to what are we actually there to do and how do we do it? And I'm going to suggest that there are five purposes of the client consultation. There might be more in your, in your world. You can certainly add more, but these five fit themselves into a nice little acronym called SCOPE. And uh, you think about a scope of work, and that's a good way to remember this acronym. And if you remember it, it will keep you on track during the client consultation. So here's what it stands for. The S in scope. This is really, this is, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be hard to remember. Okay. The S in scope stands for scope. You got it. Scope. Uh, it's a great way. It, this is a positive reinforcement to get yourself started. The S in scope stands for scope. You can always remember that. I'm there, first of all, to learn enough about the project to create a proposal. Now, for most of us, that's the, the all, that's all we ever do in a client consultation. I just want to ask enough questions to figure out enough things so that uh, I can learn enough to create that proposal. That's definitely important, but it's only one of the five things. But that's the first. The S in scope stands for scope. The C stands for chemistry. All right, is this a client that I can really work with, right? It's like that first date. Is there chemistry here? Are we going to be a good fit working together? Can I really solve the client's problem? Are they going to appreciate the work that I do? Are they going to treat me as a professional? Or are they going to try to micromanage me? What's the chemistry like as I'm dealing with that client? Now, by the way, I'm going to deep dive into each of these in just a minute. Um, so uh, we're just hitting the, the high points now. The O in scope, so very important, is when you start to talk about ongoing services. We have to explain the importance of our ongoing services like WordPress management and care plans. The P in scope stands for process. And from that very conversation, I am of the opinion that you should set expectations early by very simply explaining your process for how you build websites and the way this thing works. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And last of all, this is the secret sauce. Provide a ballpark estimate to get the client buy-in. Now, that's really important. That is the secret sauce to this whole thing. Uh, and if you use this process, every year since I've been using this process, I've run these numbers, and I consistently close over 90% of my proposals that I write. Now, your mileage may vary in that. Every year, that the last several years I've been using this process for every client meeting, I've closed over 90% of the proposals that I've written. Now, we're going to deep dive into each one of these five steps in the scope strategy. And uh, there is a really cool one-page summary download with uh, all the questions you're going to see on your screen. Uh, and I, I, I can't give you the link in the middle because of WordCamp rules, but I can give it to you again at the end. So, uh, you can have this downloadable so you don't have to snap pictures or scribble or whatever during this whole thing. There's a lot of questions. All right, so let's talk about scope. Now, this is where we're going to spend the most of our time uh, in the process. We're going to ask a lot of questions about what the project is going to be and do. Now, by the way, one thing that I, and I should really add a slide for this, but one thing I always do at the beginning of the client consultation is I ask for the client's permission to run the meeting. That's an old business trick. Uh, if you watch The Office and you remember one of the early episodes was called Diversity Day uh, and Michael Scott keeps trying to take control of the meeting. One of the first things that, uh, that third party instructor says is, Michael, can I have your permission to run this meeting? And it's really a nice way of saying, look, if, if you'll let me run the meeting, then I've got a, a great way to do this. And so I ask the client's permission. And I'll usually say something like this. You know, I want to make the best use of this hour that we have together. And I will limit it to an hour. There's a, a hard stop. 
Um, I want to make the best use of this time so that you get the most out of it and I get the most out of it. And I've got a really good process and checklist for running this meeting. And can I have your permission just to keep us moving along through this process? Uh, and so I'll get the client to buy in. And then we start to talk about some scope questions. Now, um, I arrange the scope questions, the client intake questions, into five main buckets. And I do it this way because if you just try to do the, the same list of questions in the same order every time, it can get a little robotic, but this lets you kind of maneuver around from one bucket of questions to the next, depending on what's the most important thing to this client in their project. But these are, and you can add buckets or add questions or whatever. This is just a, a kind of an overview to let you know kind of how I, I do this. Uh, but there's the five main buckets. There's the business bucket, the purpose, the website itself, the launch, and the budget. Uh, all of these need to be in there. You might add more. That's up to you. The other thing I will suggest is that you create a checklist for every consultation. Because if you do not have a checklist that you use for every project every time, every client conversation for every project every time, you will forget to ask some of these questions. You just will. And inevitably, by Murphy's Law, the question or questions that you forget to ask will inevitably be the ones that are the most important to this project. So just use a checklist. Uh, and, and that way you are covered. Now, by the way, I actually, I use Evernote. I've got a checklist template for this consultation that I can just duplicate into a note. And the pro version of Evernote has this beautiful little recording feature. And so I ask for the client's permission to record. And uh, we do this live usually. And I ask the questions and uh, I'm recording the audio. So if the client says something really important, I can type, okay, that happened at 23 minutes, 12 seconds. And then it's really a cool way to do it. And then Evernote saves that little audio file right there in the notes. So I mean, that's what I use. You can use whatever you want. It's just pretty cool to do that way. All right, so five main buckets, a checklist for every consultation. And by the way, again, all these questions are on the one pager download at the end. So let's talk about, first of all, the business bucket. All right, these are when we're asking questions about the client's business. And I always ask the client, okay, what's your elevator pitch or what's your coffee shop answer? And this is, uh, especially if you're, you're not listening in the States, this is something we in the, in the United States uh, call, uh, can you summarize who you are, what you do, who you do it for in a short sentence? Like if you just ordered a cup of coffee and somebody, hey, how's it going? What do you do, by the way? And you can just, a three or four sentence summary, or it's called an elevator pitch because it's something that you can give to someone you meet in an elevator between floors, right? It's a short, simple, uh, three, four sentences max. This is who I am, what I do, who I do it for. Can the client actually do that? Now, you'll be surprised how many people are in business and they can't answer that simple question. And you get this blank look and they're like, oh, hmm, huh, yeah, um, right. I I'm not sure how to summarize this. Uh, by the way, do, do you have an elevator pitch? Uh, those of you who are listening today, uh, you really ought to do that. Um, anyhow, so asking the client, you know, can they summarize their business? That's going to tell you a lot about how much they understand their business. And then some other basic questions. What do you do? What do you make? What's your service you provide? Uh, who is your competition? Who is your ideal customer? And why, this, and this is the one where you get a lot of blank faces. Why is it that your ideal customer should choose you instead of your competition? That's huge. And a lot of people can't because I'm a really good person, because I'm easy to work with. I, I don't know. Why should they choose me instead of my competitor? I don't know. Can they answer that question? Uh, what's your price point? How is it that you're finding customers now? Do you have an existing brand identity? That's huge. So many times we spend, uh, we equal giving the client a brand with building a website. Those are two totally different things. Um, you may be able to do that. You may need a, a graphic design professional to help you with that. But the goal of the questions in the business bucket is to determine all right, how much does this client understand their business? How much do they understand their business? Because you'll find, if you're like me, and I've met with clients now since 1995, a lot of, cli a lot of clients have really don't understand their business at all. And the client actually may not be ready for a website. Maybe a marketing consultation is the first step. Maybe you can provide that service. Maybe you can't. If you can't, then partner with a marketing professional in your area that, and you can work together. You build the websites, they do the, the marketing and branding. But this is why content often takes forever. 
So I, usually if I'm speaking live, I'll do a poll of the, the live audience in a room and say, okay, how many of you right now are stalled on content with a website project? And like, you know, three quarters of the room raises their hands, maybe more. Uh, how many of you have been stalled on a website because of content in the last year? Every hand's going to go up because everybody's always waiting on content. And the reason is to build content for the website, you start asking the client these questions like, who are you? What do you do? Okay, I got that part. But why should they choose you? Oh, um, right. And it sends the client into this existential spiral where they're questioning their own existence. And they go into a cave to try to figure this out. And that's why it's like three or four months before they come back to you with content. Because we're asking questions that, wow, they're not ready to answer. So they're not even ready for a website. They need somebody to help them step through these marketing questions and, and these existential questions about their business, right? Okay, let's move into the next bucket of questions, which is what I call the purpose bucket. Now, in the purpose bucket, this is where most of the very large eyes start to happen because they've oftentimes never thought about questions like these. How does the web fit into your marketing strategy? Oh, wait, marketing strategy? I should probably have a marketing strategy. Um, you mean like if you build a website, they just won't all come to my website? Uh, you know, if, if you build it, they will come, right? I've heard that somewhere. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I have a marketing strategy. Okay, so why should your ideal customer even come to your site? What are you delivering to them on your site that makes it irresistible for them to come? What are your goals for the website? How do we even know that what I build is going to accomplish your goal? Like, what is the goal for the website other than I use the right color button that makes you happy? It, it, I, I don't know. What, what are the webs? How do we know if this project is a success? So these are difficult questions sometimes. The goal here in this bucket of questions is how much strategy assistance am I going to need to provide? And I guarantee you that if you look at all the websites that you built over the past 12 months and you start to really think about, okay, how much of the actual time I spent on the website was strategy assistance versus the actual building of the website, you'll probably find that it's at least a third uh, of the website time that you spend. And so, again, the client may not be ready for a website. They may need a discovery phase where you help them to answer some of these questions about all the why questions and, and how, you know, how's this going to work? So, and by the way, don't get thrown off by this whole idea of a discovery phase. A discovery has a scope of work and a deliverable for a price just like any other project. We're going to help you answer these questions such as, uh, you know, how, how does this fit in your marketing strategy? Why should your ideal customer? What are the goals? We'll help you define all those things. Maybe some of the other business questions as well, but it's going to cost some money because you're not ready for a website yet. All right, then we get into the bucket of questions about the website itself. Now, for most of us, these are the only questions we ask because this is all we ever really think about is, okay, we sit down and we start to think about, oh, what plugin can I use for that? And that's totally the wrong that we got to get big picture first, right? Talk about the business and the purpose. Now we can get to the nitty gritty of uh, things like, all right, do you have a domain name already? Uh, who is going to be our point of contact as we build the website? By the way, that is singular point of contact. Uh, we want one person at the organization to be a contact. Uh, and that person is responsible for wrangling all of the opinions of every other stakeholder in the organization. Otherwise, it becomes a camel, which is a horse built by committee. Um, where is the content from the site going to come from? When you ask this question, it, it, so if you're taking notes, this is one to underline and put a star beside, because when you say, okay, where is the content for the site going to come from? The words on the page. You're immediately telling the client that you're probably not going to do that. I'm not the most qualified person to write about your business. Either we bring in a writer or you do it or whatever, but this is not, you know, th th we got to talk about this. One of the biggest assumptions that clients make about a website simply because they have no frame of reference is, well, I just pay you and you're going to poof, make the website appear out of thin air, all the pictures and all the text and all, you're just, it's just going to appear because I pay you to do it. And that's not how it works. This is a relationship. Uh, we're going to have to walk together down this road and there's some things I've got to do and there's some things you've got to do. So content is one of those things that you've got to do. Roughly how many pages is the site going to include? Now, we all know working with WordPress, adding a page is not like it used to be back in the olden days when you had to handcraft every page. You can just hit add new page and paste in some text from a Word document unless the, you're using a page builder or you're using Gutenberg or some other 
uh, system where you are what I call handcrafting the pages. So how many pages is this site? Is it a five-page brochure site? Is it a 50-page site with lots of products and services? How many handcrafted pages are we going to need? Uh, because all those handcrafted pages take a lot of time. The copy and paste just drop in the content. Those are pretty easy. Uh, are you going to be blogging or sharing news items? We need to know that. Are you selling things online? If that's a yes, you probably should have another subsection of e-commerce related questions. Um, that's beyond the scope of this presentation. Uh, do you need an event calendar or event registration of any kind? Do your clients need to log in for any reason? Don't ever not ask that question. Uh, I have gotten to the end of a project and shown the client the final product, and the client said, oh, where do my clients log in to see what their account balance is? Um, it, we never talked about that. <laughs> like, it's not in the scope. Oh, but that's the whole reason for the website. So my clients can log in and check their back. Well, I, we ne you never mentioned that, like, ever. Now, so press pause for a minute. If you've ever experienced something like that, why do those things happen? Why do we get to the end and the client says, oh, where do my, this, the reason that we were building the website is so our clients can check in and, you know, log in and check their account balance. Whose fault is it that we're just discovering this now at the end? And you might say, well, it's a client's fault. They should have told us, or it's my fault. I should have asked. And it's really probably a balance of those two things. You can sure avoid a lot of headache if you ask the right questions in the beginning. So do your clients need to log in to the website for any reason? Uh, do you use social media? Which networks? Do you have videos that you want to use? And by the way, are they ready? Or are we going to be waiting six months for the videographer to do his or her thing? Uh, do you want testimonials? And again, do you have them already? Because that can take forever. This is another question very important to ask. Is there any third-party integration needed? Because a third-party integration can turn very quickly a $7,000 project into a $17,000 project, depending on what you're trying to do uh, or more. Uh, so what is the third-party integration, uh, and what does that look like? Here's a really important question to ask. Should the website simply be a credibility piece for you, or are you wanting to generate leads from search results? And, and that's the beginning of a conversation of, okay, when people search for you, are you just wanting, like, if they search for my name, I want to come up and I want to have a pretty website? Because that's a legitimate reason to have a website. A lot of, prof especially smaller uh, you know, like small accounting firms, smaller architect, you know, smaller professional firms, they don't want 100 leads a week coming in from Google search results, best architect in Chicago or whatever. That's not what they're after. They want two or three people who are looking for them and they look great on the web and that's who they want to find. And e both of those scenarios are fine. We just need to know about that at the beginning. Are we trying to build a credibility piece or are you trying to generate leads from search results? Uh, and this is the catch-all question. Aside from everything else, aside from just communicating information and whatever else we've talked about, is there anything else the website needs to do? Anything at all? And this question is really great for uncovering hidden expectations. Oh, yeah, we need to have blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, my, client, my, my clients need to be able to log in and check their account balance or whatever. So uh, aside from information, is there anything else that the website needs to do? You ask questions like these, you're going to be able to create that solid scope of work for the project. All right, let's move into the launch bucket, the next bucket of questions here that talk about the launch of the website. All right, do you have a deadline? Because if it's next week, that's a problem. Uh, is there a deadline to launch this site? Uh, by the way, rarely do I ever promise timeframes. If a client says, how long does a typical web project take or how long will it take you to build my site? The, question, the answer to that question for me is always around six weeks. And I'll tell them, look, we can execute a lot more quickly than that, but we're typically waiting on uh, approvals or content or something from our clients. Uh, and with that back and forth, it usually takes around six weeks for a basic website to be built and launched. Now, if you come to the table with all your content and all the assets and all that stuff at the beginning, we could probably knock this out in a couple of weeks. But if a, an early deadline is part of the scope of work, then uh, that needs to be in the scope of work. Like launch date is this, and they're probably going to pay more for that because it's a rush project. Here's a question you absolutely do not want to forget to ask. Otherwise, you will find yourself in a nightmare situation where you launch the website and you screw up the client's email. And that is, how do you handle email right now? Because a lot of people, they may have their email on some other hosting company 
And when you move the site over to your hosting, all of that breaks. And that's not a fun day. I say that with firsthand experience because I have been the idiot that broke that before. And it's not a lot of fun to try to put back together. So how do you handle email? You know, how does that work? By the way, uh, I, as a business, do not offer email services to clients. Email is the quicksand of a web business. You will spend more time and more hassle and more headache trying to support email than virtually any other thing that you can do. Uh, so the, the magic phrase that I use with clients is this. Email is an IT issue, not a web development issue. And I have a few uh, IT firms locally. If you don't have an IT person, I will connect you with one that can help you set up uh, Google G Suite or Office 365 or whatever service you want to use. And I'll work with that person to set up all the stuff to make it work uh, on the web end. But we don't do email. Uh, it's not email is IT. It is not web development. Uh, so last of all, who will be responsible for maintaining the site after it's been launched? Another key question. That's going to lead you into the discussion of ongoing services later because uh, this is a site that's going to need to be maintained and kept up to date. Uh, so, and by the way, when we, I'll get into that in a minute, ongoing services. I'm going to get ahead of myself here. But the goal of this bucket of questions is what does a time frame look like and to start that discussion about ongoing services, right? So we need to ask these questions. All right, one more, the budget. Do you have a ballpark budget for this project? Don't be afraid to ask that question. Uh, one of the, the things that I find that lots of people doing WordPress client work, uh, they're afraid to talk about money with the client. And you know something I've said for years is that your success in the business of doing client work is directly proportional to your ability to talk about money with the client. Don't be afraid of it. You've learned some stuff. You've bought some tools. You can do a thing. You should be able to charge for it and not feel bad about it. What's your ballpark budget for the project? What are you expecting to invest in this project? Now, if it seems low, well, okay, so you've got $3,000 to invest. Well, what you're describing is about a $5,000 project. So one of two things needs to happen. I can't sell you a $5,000 project for $3,000. I just can't do that. But we can e you can either raise your expected budget to accommodate for that, or maybe we can take some things away from the scope, simplify it, Maybe we do a phase two and roll the other stuff into a phase two. Uh, so uh, it just opens that discussion. Uh, then you also want to find out, all right, what is the decision-making process for deciding who you're going to go with? Do you have to get three bids? Where are you in the process? How does that work? What is the process of making this decision? And then finally, when do you expect to make the final decision? The goal here is make sure you're not wasting your time. Now, this is a great example of a time when I will rearrange the buckets. So uh, just, just a few weeks ago, I got a call. It was a referral uh, for a local, uh, a, a local division of a national nonprofit agency. Uh, and they wanted a website for their local division of this uh, larger national organization. Now, if you do any work with nonprofits, and especially in this scenario, where it's a local division of a national agency, you know right away these people have no money for marketing. They, there's just no budget there. So the first thing, I went directly to the budget bucket and asked, all right, do, what does your ballpark budget look like for this site? And it's okay. And, and you know, and the, well, we, only, we have about $1,200. And at that point, before I wasted any more time with the client, I said, look, the, the minimum project that we take is about $4,500. And so I can make some suggestions for some other developers who might be able to do this in your price range. Um, and so it just avoids you and them wasting a lot of time. Uh, so don't be afraid to ask those questions. It's perfectly legitimate. Okay, let's move into the next part of the acronym. Now, we've spent a lot of time on scope, right? And you will typically, just like in this presentation, we spend the majority of time talking through the buckets of questions in the scope part of the scope strategy. Uh, and you'll probably spend 45 minutes of an hour at least talking through those questions we just mentioned, the buckets of questions under scope. Now, at this point, we move into chemistry. Is this a client that you are comfortable working with? So we've spent 45 minutes or so with this client already. During that time when you are asking questions, you want to you ask questions, but you want to listen very carefully, and you want to be on the alert for red flags. Is there anything in my gut that's just making me think, ah, oh, mm, it's kind of cringy, there's a problem? Because after spending 45 minutes or so with the client, 
you should probably have a good idea as to whether this is a client you can work with or not. But uh, let's look at some red flags that a lot of times we might find in the scope discussion that would be maybe some warnings that the chemistry isn't right. So here are a few common red flags. Uh, unanswered questions, big red flag. So the client doesn't know what they need. And uh, we talked a little bit about that under the business and the purpose and all that. Uh, the client doesn't know what they need. A discovery phase can be helpful. So those unanswered questions, those matter. And so it's a red flag. Uh, something else. Disrespectfulness. So if during the process of working through the questions about the website, the client doesn't listen to you, uh, they interrupt, they won't answer your question, or they complain about your price already, or they ignore any advice you happen to give, or if the client is just a jerk, this is a huge red flag. Again, this is a first date. This is the best version of the client you're ever going to see because everybody's always on their best behavior the first time they meet somebody, usually. So if the client's a jerk in the first conversation, it probably doesn't get any better from there. Disrespectfulness, huge red flag. Scheduling problems. If the client is hard to reach, if they reschedule or if they're late, and this is, you start to notice this even as you're starting to schedule the first meeting, this doesn't get better over time. Uh, this is a client that's going to disappear on you through the project. And uh, so just be aware of that. Usually, now, of course, there's legitimate reasons for this that might just be a one-off. But in my experience, if the client is hard to reach when you're just trying to get the project uh, together, they're going to be even more hard to reach as the project goes forward. All right, this one's super important. Complaints. If the client complains about their previous web developer who did everything wrong, in air quotes, if that happens when I'm meeting with a client for the first time, it is a full stop. We're going to stop right there. We're going to dig into that situation because, okay, one of two things is true. Now, I've been doing WordPress for 10 years now, uh, over 10 years. I, I, have seen, I have seen developers do things that, I mean, y'all, you, you would have to mess up this bad on purpose. It was so bad. Like, it, it was bad, bad. Uh, these are the rescue sites a lot of times we'll get from disappearing web developers. And oh my gosh, they, it's just, I mean, the work is horrible. So I know that there are knucklehead web developers out there. I know that. But a lot of times when the client is complaining about the previous. A little bit of technical trouble with Nathan's video. Um, we were trying to restore him, but we have not found him yet. <laughs> Um, there's great discussion in the comments, so for those of you that are just watching and haven't seen the comments, make sure you check those out. Everyone's being very supportive of each other and um, asking a lot of questions. Um, we got some great feedback on Nathan's talk, so be sure to go and fill out the feedback for him. That way he knows how great he did.